Hello everyone and welcome to CCL University. Tonight we're going to be talking about geopolitics and making the future we want. Our guest speaker is the very special, incredible Joseph Robertson, who is CCL's Global Strategy Director. Um, there's a lot that's been going on in Congress and the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, but there's also a lot that's been going on all around the world that um, we have been a part of and other countries have been a part of. Um, I think we're in for a really incredible talk. Um, and from that, I, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Joe. Joe, take it away. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so just starting out, we have a few learning goals for tonight. Uh, one is how do international climate negotiations work? Um, and I assure you, uh, people who've been in the process for 10 or even 20 years are always learning more. Uh, everything is always evolving and it's a vast and complex landscape. Um, two is how is CCL involved in the international process? Um, and three, what are the practical connections of the global negotiations to national law? We have an agenda where we're going to distill all of that down into five sections, starting with the global negotiations, how they work, then what's at stake in the process, then who's involved, not just countries, but cities and other stakeholders, climate smart finance, which is not just climate finance that goes to directly to clean energy and things like that, but the alignment of finance in the mainstream economy with climate goals. Um, and how widening out to those kind of uh, wider pools of public and private finance helps us achieve more faster. And then what's next? And when we talk about what's next, it's not just that we're talking about what kind of climate policy is next or what meeting is next, but what are the new pathways to a climate smart future? What venues, what kind of new processes are emerging where we're innovating faster, we're solving problems together, we're sharing knowledge and resources and getting closer to the goal of avoiding dangerous climate change. And then at the end, we'll have some Q&A. So why do we want to talk about geopolitics? Well, a lot of times we think of the climate issue as a kind of niche concern. And of course, all of us who are concerned know it's not that, but sometimes we still fall into the trap of thinking that it's something some people care about and know about and other people need to be convinced before it becomes relevant to them and their life. Uh, the reality of the international negotiating process is that virtually every aspect of geopolitical reality is being influenced by this problem and by how we respond to it. And for the countries that are leading the way, solving big problems and becoming the world leaders in climate smart innovation, they are changing their future in more ways than we realize. They're changing their standing in the international community. They're gathering influence to themselves um, that a powerful country like the United States might take for granted. This is very much a geopolitical uh, problem and a geopolitical process. So how does the process work? The global negotiations, the UN talks. Um, the UN climate talks are based on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was agreed in Rio de Janeiro at the Earth Summit in 1992. At that time, the president of the United States was George H.W. Bush. He was an advocate of solving this problem. He helped marshal an alliance of nations to get this treaty to be agreed in a way that was amenable to the United States. We didn't get everything that we wanted, but we got a lot of what we thought was important. And it has led to what is arguably the biggest, most complex international negotiating process in the world. This year was the 24th annual negotiating process. Um, it is an amazing global climate Congress of people coming together from 195 countries. Uh, the European Union is the 196th party to the convention, uh, but also thousands of observer organizations. The COP isn't just a negotiation among countries. Uh, it is a, a massive global brainstorming process, and it affects areas of policy far beyond just 
what national governments will do. But in the process itself, the parties, the, the 195 countries in the European Union, the 196 parties, they are the only ones who can negotiate. And the interesting detail about how they negotiate is that they have to reach consensus at the end of their two week negotiating period every year. To reach consensus among 196 parties is not easy. Um, and though the powerful countries of the world have a lot of influence, that standard helps less powerful countries, less wealthy countries have some influence and make some demands. Uh, that's partly how 1.5 degrees Celsius became an alternate standard to 2 degrees Celsius as the upper limit for global warming because countries that would literally disappear, uh, according to the science, were able to convince other countries that that was a reasonable kind of consensus to reach. Uh, in Paris. Now, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change established a standard of common but differentiated responsibilities and placed greater action burden on historic polluters. That means countries like the United States, Great Britain, that were the early industrial uh, countries, they're historic polluters and so have a burden to act immediately. President Bush at the time said we should immediately begin acting together as the world's industrial countries. The document that lists those historic polluters is called Annex I because it was the first attachment to the convention. The Annex I countries do not include India and China. And of course, now that they have heavily industrialized and they are major polluters, um, that's a problem. Uh, it was already considered a problem in the 1990s when the Kyoto Protocol was agreed. Um, what's important about the Paris Agreement is that while it upholds the common but differentiated responsibilities standard, it also requires all parties to make nationally determined contributions to the global climate response. What that means is every country has to have an aggressive climate action plan that will help reduce global emissions. And when you're India or China, if you're choosing to, to just trim your rate of increase of emissions or not really cut emissions, then you're not doing your part. Um, that became evident in the lead up to Paris, not just after Paris. And both India and China have been planning for aggressive emissions reduction. So the Paris Agreement gave the US one of the biggest things that it has sought since the convention. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change exists to provide a regular update on what the science tells us about that goal of, dan of avoiding dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. What is danger? How do we avoid it? Um, the 1.5 degrees Celsius upper limit uh, has essentially become the new global legal standard. The reason is that the Paris Agreement defined the convention's avoiding danger standard as well below two degrees or alternately 1.5 degrees pending scientific review by the IPCC. The IPCC's report on the dangers of going above 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming is so alarming that it is clearly uh, the new standard. We cannot afford to go past that. The change will be too radical and too disruptive. Now, I want to share a little bit about this room, this image that's been in the background so far during the presentation. Um, this is a special plenary session at the COP. Plenary means everybody's there. Uh, all of the parties are there, so 195 countries, EU, all of the UN agencies are invited to be there as well, and all observers who can fit into the room are there. So there are thousands of people there. Usually in a situation like this, there's a lot of buzz. Yes, people are speaking into a microphone, they're addressing the plenary session, they're speaking for their country or their negotiating group of countries, um, but there's always a lot of buzz and moving around and bustling and shuffling of chairs and, and everything. This room was totally silent. And I've never been in a plenary session like that in a global negotiation where there was so much quiet and so much attention. Um, all of these people are presumably professionals and experts. They have read the IPCC report or at least the summary of it, or at least an article about the really serious warning signs. Um, but yet there was something happening in that room that was clearly a moment of awakening and transformation. People were coming to grips with the gravity of this problem in a new way. And I think it's partly to do with the fact that they were surrounded by all of these other people. 
and that what we all had in common in that room was that we were in the room where we're supposed to solve this. And it is an unbelievably daunting challenge. Uh, but the world is working together to do it, and it is humbling to watch. If you want to learn more about the IPCC's special report on the 1.5 degree danger threshold, it's at resilienceintel.org slash IPCC, and you can link to the, directly to the, the report itself from there. So what is at stake in the process? We often think about environmental policy and how we get energy and things like that. So what is at stake in this process? Um, it's not just climate policy. It's not just energy policy. It's really everything, the climate, the economy, the national security of pretty much every nation on earth is at stake in this process. Trade negotiations are at stake. The way the banking sector, the insurance sector, the healthcare sector work, the way transportation, shipping work, the cost of pretty much everything you buy is at stake in this process. And that is maybe the second biggest thing that's misunderstood about this process in the United States. Uh, our politics virtually ignores this process, our, our legislative politics. Um, and yet virtually everything about our lives is being determined uh, by how successful this process is. Uh, so first thing is every nation has to create its own national climate plan. It's part of their, the global response. Uh, energy, transport, agriculture, industry, all of these must be decar decarbonized as soon as possible. Uh, human settlements, that's the language that's often used, which means cities and also small villages must be completely redesigned with new infrastructure, new economies, new ways of doing business and new kind of politics. Failure on any of these means that we're going to fail on many or most of them. Uh, so this is obviously a major collaborative process that we're undertaking. Um, there'll be threats to food and water security. We're already seeing them. Arguably, Syria and Yemen are both disastrous wars that have to do with the climate impacts of, of this kind that affect food and water supplies. Um, disaster management costs are already becoming unaffordable. The United States spent as much in 2017 on major disasters as it did from 1980 to 2010. That rate of increase is unsustainable and it is accelerating exponentially. Um, so much so that reinsurance companies who provide insurance to insurers are saying that the world may be uninsurable by mid-century. And what that means as shorthand is insurance companies won't be able to make money. Uh, you can't make money if you're always paying out more than you can possibly take in from what people are willing to pay you for insurance. So when you look at the climate problem through this lens, through the global negotiating process, you think about all the complexity that's going into it. You realize that combating climate change is not about polar bears and environmental sustainability, trees and forests. Uh, it is about those things, but it is not only and it is not principally about those things. It is principally about the sustainability of human life as we know it. Our societies, the rights and freedoms we take for granted, our prosperous modern economies, we don't have a way to make them work in a world that has changed as much as a world with more than 1.5 degrees of warming uh, will have changed things. That's where the question of adaptation comes in, and uh, I'll get to that near the end of this, but uh, keep in mind that as we get further and further along, adaptation isn't just accepting climate change, it's also getting used to the fact that we'll be innovating faster than we ever have before. So who's involved in this process? These, this is a negotiating table that has to do with climate finance. You have every kind of country in the world, the richest, the poorest at the table. You have uh, experts who are coming from many different backgrounds. Um, and there are specific groups of delegates who are accredited to attend these meetings. They basically fall into these categories. Um, the parties are the nations. They get pink badges, so they're easily identifiable. They get to go wherever they want to, unless it's a closed meeting of other countries or of a specific group of countries. Um, the United Nations, uh, anyone with that blue badge, basically gets to go wherever they want to, unless it's a closed negotiation. They, they can 
close negotiations only to countries. <clears throat> but the UN staff that are there are there to facilitate. They're there to help make sure everything is working, help make sure the rules of the convention are being followed, help make sure progress is being made. Um, and that things are running smoothly. Observers and NGOs, that's like us, Citizens Climate Education, Citizens Climate Lobby, the Climate Action Network, non-governmental organizations, everyone from you know, the Red Cross to um, trade associations representing businesses, um, even oil companies may be represented because they may belong to trade associations that are nonprofits that are there to simply observe, to share their views on economics, um, it's not that easy to sit down and have time to talk to people who are at the negotiating table because they're basically reading all the time or negotiating all the time or strategizing all the time. But if you spend time uh, doing what we do in Citizens Climate Lobby and building up people's trust so they know, you know what, I can talk to these people. They're not gonna share what I said with the press. They're not gonna go to my you know, rivals or complicate my life. They're just gonna help out however they can then you can actually learn quite a lot and you can influence quite a lot. The media, interestingly, have the lowest level of access. So, of course, everybody wants to get their message out. But when you put media in a, a sensitive negotiating session, it changes everything. Uh, negotiations basically shut down completely and everybody starts making public statements. Um, and so the media don't get to participate in negotiations or even observe. They get to be in the big ceremonial opening and closing sessions. They obviously get to be in press conferences and they are constantly interviewing people all over the, the whole venue the whole time. Now, um, I want to add that a couple of years ago, observing how everything worked, we felt there was a need for more citizen participation and we put forward a proposal for how to reform the process to be a little bit more inclusive. That reform proposal is at this web address, engageforclimate.org slash UNFCCC. What's really wonderful about this is that though what we proposed was simply guidance input, it wasn't an official mandate of any kind, uh, wasn't part of a contest or anything. Um, pretty much all of the ideas we had proposed became part of what was called the Talanoa Dialogue. So over this last year, the Fijian presidency of last year's negotiations, 2017, the COP23, proposed that there should be not just the facilitative dialogue among the countries that the Paris Agreement mandated, but that that facilitative dialogue should take place in the spirit of Talanoa. What that means is uh, it's, a, it's a South Pacific uh, cultural tradition of a dialogue where everyone is a peer of everyone else. Nobody's standing or power matters. What matters is you share your story and you talk about what to do and how to move forward by telling personal stories. Um, and it, it was a tremendously powerful way to change the dynamic in the negotiating rooms. It also became an open process for people all over the world, in communities, in universities, people in town hall meetings with part government, part you know, citizens, or one or the other, expert meetings, non-expert meetings. Uh, we put together a toolkit to help people hold those kind of meetings, and we're going to be sustaining that effort, even though the Talanoa Dialogue has now ended. Um, we're going to be continuing that process, and so are many other organizations, including UN agencies uh, and some governments. And the reason you see Arnold Schwarzenegger in this picture is because he was the governor of California. He was a major advocate for... Um, the reason you see Arnold Schwarzenegger there is because as governor of California, former governor, he's a big advocate of cities and states having a say in international politics. Um, and the, the other gentleman standing there who you see the back of his head is the mayor of Bonn, Germany, where the negotiations were last year. Um, as I said, we're going to be continuing that process. And I know around the United States, there are state governments, city governments that are also actively doing this kind of uh, of work. So I want to jump ahead now to, sorry, I'm just, okay, <clears throat> to the issue of climate smart finance. We basically have decided that we have three major agenda items in this global process. One is participation, as I just talked about. Another is carbon pricing, of course. We have 
principles that are based on the fee and dividend plan that we think any nation could follow. Um, and then climate smart finance. Now, I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory for how we came to work on this and how we are working on this. Um, in Lima, in October of 2015, less than two months before the Paris climate negotiations, Christine Lagarde, who's the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, uh, and it's important to recognize the International Monetary Fund exists. It's a post-World War II organization. It's one of the founding institutions of the UN system. It exists in order to uh, make sure that national budgets don't um, that national budgets don't essentially go bankrupt and end up in a situation where countries collapse, and you end up having the problem that uh, that we had in the 1930s, where otherwise reasonable countries became dangerous to international peace and security. The IMF has that responsibility and they're only supposed to look at math. Is the budget for this country solvent? Christine Lagarde said at this meeting in October of 2015 in Peru, uh, she referenced the Nazca lines, the ancient, uh, essentially uh, what they call geoglyphs, large scale earthen sculptures uh, that create pictures. She said, you know, you, you can't see up close what it is. It looks like a wall or a line or some rocks. But when you look at it from a helicopter view, a bird's eye view, you see a hummingbird, for instance. But she said that those Nazca lines are macrocritical influences. They shape overall economies. The economy can only be as big as it can be within those boundaries. And some of those influences she cited were climate change, rapid technological innovation, access to education, income inequality, empowerment of women, democratic human rights, et cetera. Um, she said that the IMF will now start looking at those things as influences on national budget solvency. Because for instance, if two countries have virtually the same you know, size, the same economy, the same population, even the same culture and politics, but there's a major difference between the two, for instance. One of those countries empowers uh, all of its children to go to school, to learn, to get an education, to go on to higher education, to become productive citizens, and the other one persecutes young girls to the point of even you know, violence against girls who, who pursue an education. It is well documented that the country that treats young girls that badly is far more likely to descend into chaos and violence within a short period of time. So it's 10 year projections for its budget are nonsense, basically. Um, these are major influences that change everything about a country. Climate change, as you know, radically alters the fate of nations. In the US, we're dealing with rising costs, but in the Caribbean, you have countries that have lost 200, 300, 400% of, of annual gross domestic product from single storms. When she said that, she set in motion a process where countries would now start looking at how do they advance climate smart finance? How do they make sure that all of their investments have a climate intelligence component to them? Um, this is just for fun. It's a picture of a blueprint of a bi-wing airplane designed by the Wright brothers. Um, the point here is that we are designing a future economy and this future economy has to be based on institutions that have lightweight footprints. They have to be they have to have light footprints on the environment, on the climate system. They have to have light footprints on food and water supplies. They have to have light footprints on justice considerations and the kind of things that blur borders and destabilize countries. Um, lightweight allows you to fly. You need to be aerodynamic. You need to be well-designed. Um, we haven't thought in this way about how those macro critical influences have to influence private business, have to influence public spending, but now we have to think about those things. Essentially, it's possible to say that everything is influenced by these considerations. Here you have an aerial view of uh, the delta, the area where the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers meet between the Twin Cities uh, in Minnesota. And what you see is a frozen Mississippi River, but you also see all of the industrial scale of a society. And you also see those snowy open fields. 
Some of those are parks, some of those are farms, some of those are uh, industrial sites that are covered in snow. <clears throat> it's hard to tell from this image which is which. But what you have in any major city anywhere in the world is you have this reach that goes from the center of where we design our lives out to everywhere we pull resources from. So in this one image, there are most likely hard material resources coming from every country in the world. Um, minerals coming from any country, no matter how uh, non-industrialized it is, but that has a mining. So the food that we now enjoy in the United States is of course coming from many, many countries, not just from our own abundant agricultural production. We have to somehow be able to fix all of that. And some people think that's going to be very expensive, but I, I share this simple graphic from the new climate economy uh, reporting process because what they have found is that if we act aggressively, if we do what the IPCC has said, if we meet the mandate of the Paris Agreement, if we go further and we go after all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals, by 2030, we will produce 26 trillion additional dollars in economic value above and beyond business as usual. So it is not cost. Of course, we have to invest in solutions, but we're investing in things now that are just wasting our money and making things worse. Uh, by investing more intelligently, by making climate smart investments, uh, we will be able to produce all of this new economic activity and think about how much more stable countries will be that are vulnerable to, to disintegration and collapse, how much more sustainable entire regional economies will be when the nation states themselves are not afraid of each other and afraid of the, the blurring of their borders and the destabilization of their economies. Um, this is not just a lot of money. This is a, a livable future. This is an opportunity for people to build value. So over the last several years, since right after that meeting where Christine Lagarde talked about macrocritical influences and Nazca lines, we have been helping to convene, we Citizens Climate Education, Citizens Climate Lobby, working with partners in the international community, we've been helping to convene a series of diplomatic dialogues called the Acceleration Dialogues. In that process, leaders from government, from business, from science, advocacy, economics, have consistently talked about the need for tools that non-expert decision makers can use to regularly make climate smart choices. Imagine if in that image in the background, all of the different actors you see, all the people running buildings and organizations, the airport, the highway system, the, the urban infrastructure, the sanitation, et cetera. Imagine if all of them could be making climate smart choices simply by knowing that out of the two or three things in front of them, one of them is clearly the best. Well, <clears throat> that's what the resilience intelligence or resilience intel project is. It's a way of saying we can aspire to 100% climate smart finance. There's no reason we shouldn't aspire to that. It's far more reasonable than not doing that. Um, and by connecting Earth systems data to socioeconomic data, financial sector data, we can actually help drive that change. So what's next? Where do we go from here? Well, inside the negotiating process is one thing and our national politics is another, but there are pathways to a climate smart future where we can avoid danger, we can build a much more prosperous, sustainable and just human future. Um, those pathways, include not just you know, technical change, but they also include new kinds of negotiating processes. So <clears throat> the COP is this big global process, 15 to 20,000 people at a time from 195 countries and thousands of observer organizations all together trying to figure things out. Um, not everything will be figured out there, but that process will work better because we're figuring things out in other places. So here's one of the successes for stakeholder engagement. Um, this year at the COP24 in Poland, the, the COP officially adopted uh, what's called the Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform. This is 
the first real recognition of stakeholder groups that have a direct existential involvement in this kind of policy, uh, but don't have the sovereignty of nation states to be able to intervene. Um, this creates a platform where that becomes possible. So through activities like the Talanoa Dialogue and also the local communities and indigenous peoples platform, we're beginning to see these opportunities. Here you see uh, Christiana Figueres, who was the head of the UN Climate Secretariat when the Paris Agreement was adopted. She's speaking at the launch of the Global Commission on Adaptation. This happened at The Hague in the Hall of Nights, this, this uh, amazing room, not far from where the International uh, Criminal Court is, and also quite a few paintings by the Dutch masters. Um, she is speaking about the need to aggressively transition to zero emissions, to climate smart finance, to a world where we not only accept that change is happening and figure out how to deal with it, but where we plan ahead and we adapt to the fact that we need to be innovating faster than we ever have before. The Global Commission on Adaptation <clears throat> will, over the next two years, be working to define adaptation metrics, the terms of policy and investment that will help make sure that we don't just accept change, but that we get ahead of the curve on all levels and we build resilience and we build a more just society. This is a room that I think some of you have seen before. It's the, uh, it's the World Bank conference room where they host the high level assembly of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. At this very table in, uh, in 2015, a few months before the Paris conference happened, um, right in the center at the opposite end of that room, Rachel Kite, who was at the time World Bank Vice President, she's now uh, the CEO of the UN Sustainable Energy for All effort, said that what we are doing here is a new kind of global governance. At that table, governments, businesses, including major oil companies and banks, um, universities, NGOs like Citizens Climate Lobby and the Environmental Defense Fund and others are peers. And what matters at that table is how good your ideas are, if they can help move the shared mission forward. The mission uh, adopted by the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition is to bring at least half of all global emissions under some kind of carbon price by 2025. And we are on track. We are already more than halfway to that, uh, we, we will be halfway to that level by 2020 when new policies that are coming online kick in. So that's one of the places where change is happening. Here you see what's called the Chamber Hall in the conference center where the mid-year climate negotiations happen. It's where the UN has one of its headquarters in Bonn, Germany. The Chamber Hall used to be the parliament of West Germany when Germany was separated. Uh, in this room, there's ongoing technical work and negotiation that feeds into that global process. Um, this is one of the places where we're gonna see more things happening. And then finally, obviously on Capitol Hill, there's a lot to be done. Um, and the work that all of you do is absolutely instrumental. Um, as you know, in Citizens Climate Lobby, we don't like to get into arguments with people who disagree with us. We like to listen to them and think about what are their limitations? What are their concerns? How can we help fix the problem that they observe? The fact is when someone says that the international negotiating process is somehow bad for the US, the thing they misunderstand is that it's better for the US than for any other country in the world. And that's because it is like so much of the United Nations based on our principles, based on our values, and based on the notion that if we make a better world, we're all better off. And the United States, better than any other country, knows how to invest in and capitalize on that kind of activity. Um, none of that is correctly understood in our national politics. Uh, but I like the idea that we can make it be more understood. And I like the idea that we are bringing a plan to Congress in uh, the carbon fee and dividend plan <clears throat> where they can at the same time accept and understand that there's nothing for the US to fear from the global negotiating process, far from it. 
it's good for us to get ahead of the curve and use all of the levers of influence that are part of that process and that flow from that process, like stronger trade negotiations, stronger human rights conditionality, uh, more transparency for foreign investment, et cetera, et cetera, um, that we should be able to leverage all of that for our benefit uh, and to to strengthen our economy and strengthen our democracy. The fact that we have a cost-effective way to make the US the world leader in emissions reductions and innovation is almost like icing on the cake. Um, so I wanna share here, there are a few things you can do if you're wondering what can I do to support all of this. One is think about hosting a Talanoa Dialogue event in your community. Like I said, the Talanoa Dialogue itself, the official process is closed, but we and others are gonna be carrying that same model forward. And if you wanna have a meeting of five people or 50 people, if you wanna invite public officials or not, or business leaders or whomever, you can use that event to share ideas that we can then bring into the global process, um, both on our own and also with partners, depending on what the issues are. Um, Talk to people you know about the benefits and the strategic value of leading globally. Um, that's already part of how we talk about the value of fee and dividend. We want to be first in the race to establish the climate smart economy of the 21st century. Um, we will lose a heck of a lot as a country if we aren't first. Um, but beyond just being first and the economic value of being an innovation leader, there's so much in terms of geopolitical standing and security that we can, that we can get from being leaders in this process that anybody, no matter what they think of, of climate and energy, should be on board with, with having that influence. And finally, we have a global climate civics action team uh, in CCL community. You should join it. And um, it's a way to help organize outcomes from these local Talanoa dialogue events. It's a way to help support uh, people that are going uh, to some of these international meetings and make sure that we are essentially stitching a tighter and smarter fabric of climate action. I know Joe is happy to talk to anyone, anytime I can make that commitment for him. <laughs> yes, please do email me and we'll, and we'll be in touch. I can follow up on any of your questions. Uh, I do want to say, because someone asked, who is a good person to send to the negotiations? Um, I, we, we love CCL volunteers. Um, it, it doesn't matter what category someone fits into. They have to be someone who is, you know, passionate about this work, able to think on their feet, ready to deal with complexity, um, and a CCL style team player, and they'd probably be a great addition. Uh, feel free to follow up anytime. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it was really incredible and very informative. And I think we can all say good night. And I hope everyone's 2019 is going well. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Everybody. Happy New Year. Joe, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.